told I'm the district coordinator for the 5th District for the Fish and Vessel Safety Program. And I'm basically going to give you just a brief overview of what we do, some of the regulations, some of the challenges, and some of the fishing vessel uh, mariners face when they're out at sea. <clears throat> okay, in simple terms, a commercial fishing vessel is any vessel that sells its catch. That could be um, somebody on a, like a John Boat, that they land their catch and they go to sell it, or it could be on these big fish processors, um, it could be the trawlers, it could be the deal netters, um, it could be just about anybody. So in the 5th District, we have about anywhere from three to 5,000 commercial fishing vessels that operate annually. In the Coast Guard, we have about 35,000 vessels. So you see we have quite a few fishing vessels that we have to deal with. And like I said, the different types of vessels, there's the crabbers, long liners, gill netters, trawlers, scallopers. Uh, now the big thing is the tuna fish with uh, wicked tuna on television. A recreational boat gets the um, uh, they're, they're allowed to go out and catch, if they get the permits, they can go out and catch the tuna fish. So they're considered uh, commercial vessels. So that's another thing that we have to deal with for the different vessels. Okay, our area of uh, uh, <clears throat> responsibility goes all the way up to Philadelphia, uh, Delaware, uh, Maryland, North Carolina, and Virginia. Um, uh, like I said, we have about three to 5,000 vessels that we consider commercial <coughs> fishing vessels in our AOR, and they are spread out everywhere. I mean, we could have them in pockets all over the place. Uh, but in each of, it's listed up here, in each of our sectors, these are the, the areas where the highest concentrations of fishing vessels are located. And they could be anywhere from 20 to maybe 100, depends on the areas. <coughs> Okay, regulations. Everybody loves regulations. <laughs> Just so you know, I don't make the regulations. <laughs> Unfortunately, I have to enforce the regulations. I do get to comment on some of the regulations that are provided from headquarters or that are established or that are mandated by Congress, but I'm just one voice, and my opinion usually doesn't hold a lot of weight, and they already decided what they're going to do. So what we try to do is we try to um, act as a go-between for the mariner and the program. And back in 1995, the uh, Commercial Fishing Vessel Safety Act was created, and that's what kind of brought about our fishing vessel program. Before that, we really didn't have any regulations in place to promote any safety, so this is where it all began. And over the years, there's been an Authorization Act and policy changes that's kind of ramped up our, our uh, program to make it a little bit more robust than it was. Um, today, uh, the, the biggest one was in 2012, where it, before that, if you wanted an exam, it was a voluntary thing. So. There was no penalty. You would say, come look at my boat. We would go look at it. And if there was anything wrong, we would give you like a work list. We would fix it. We would get a decal and away you went. But if you chose not to do anything, nobody cared. It was no big deal. You know, but it would just, you know, make sure that your people were, were exposed to the safety requirements and make sure they had everything. Well, that all changed in 2010. They, the Authorization Act came out and in the infinite wisdom of somebody, they decided that if your vessel was beyond three nautical miles, you're going to have to have a, a voluntary exam to become a mandatory exam. And then the Authorization Act of 2012 delayed it, and here we are, 2016. We're still waiting for the regulations to actually come out in the CFRs that puts it in writing, but we're, as of October 15th of last year, if you are on a commercial fishing vessel that operates beyond three nautical miles, you're required to have our safety exam. You have to have the decal and the whole down the yard. Um, so that's what we're trying to, we're waiting for the regulations to come out in the CFRs, but who knows when that's going to be, but right now we're enforcing that. Okay, so the other things that we do is education and outreach. Before the regulations, 
mandated the exams. We have a, a, a lot of folks that are walking the docks and looking for folks that don't have a decal or never had an exam. And we try to get ourselves on board to look at their boat, let them know what they need to, to get it fixed um, so they can be safe when they're out there. Because nobody wants to go out in 20 foot seas and 100 knot winds to go save a fishing vessel. At least I don't. Um, we, we, throughout the year, we have several workshops or seminars where we talk about stability, water type and integrity, uh, vessel maintenance, um, drills, you know, that type of things. And we invite you know, the, you know, the folks to come out and take a look. You know, we have this thing called a DC wet trainer. Um, what that is is we fill it up with water and it has uh, fittings and things like we have on the vessel. And then we uh, turn the water on and then you know, leaks and they're out actually get the pipe, uh, fix leaks and do that type of thing. But we love to do it in the winter time because it makes it go a little bit faster when they're freezing. So in the summertime, they'll let it spray all day long. <coughs> Um, another thing that we do in the 5th District is every year we have what's called the Waterman's Expo. Um, we go up to Ocean City, uh, Maryland, we set up a booth, and it's, uh, you know, we, we interact with the community and the, the fishermen. It's, a, it's basically a boat show, but we talk to them about the new regulations and, you know, we're able to ask a bunch of questions. And, <coughs> so we, we've done that for the last 25 years, I believe, and it's, we usually have a good turnout. Is a good thing. Uh, some of the training that we do, uh, we sponsor and we pay for uh, the instructor drill, uh, drill instructor course where the boat captains come on. We have somebody from like Chesapeake uh, Institute, Chesapeake Institute, I'm not sure what thing that is, but they come out and they do the training on uh, how to do drills and, and whatnot so the, the, the captains can get their drill instructor courses, which is part of the requirements to get their. Uh, uh, their uh, safety decal. Okay, and on our side of the house, we do the exams. I have a number of exams, which I'll, or examiners, which I'll talk about in a few minutes. But we go out and we'll do the initial exam on your vessel. We'll do the like annual. If you complete the exam, your decal is good for two years. So if you come up on the third year, we'll do a, a renewal exam. Um, if you have a discrepancy, we do the fix it exam or follow-up exams. And the big one now is if you're at sea, you get boarded by a Coast Guard vessel and you have a problem, um, what we do is they, they might write to a violation, but if you bring that violation to us, show us that you fixed it, we'll go out there, clear that violation, and basically wipe it off the book. So you don't get fined or whatever from you know, the Beach Triple C Center. So, you know, that's a good program because ultimately we want you to be, we want the marriage to be in compliance. You know, so we're trying to give them an opportunity to make sure the vessel is square away. Okay. okay. Here's some considerations that we don't really think about, but fishermen may be at sea for days or months depending on the type of vessel. And I don't know if, if you've ever been fishing for a day, that sound, that's fun, or if you're at sea for a day, that's fun. But when you're at sea for a week or a month, that's a long time. Especially if you don't get, have a nav sat where you get television or you can't get a radio station or anything else. You're just there with your, the individuals who are on the boat and sometimes you get along with them, sometimes you don't. And then when you're work, working long hours, that makes it even tougher. Um, the experience levels are a lot different. You got the captain who usually has a zillion years of experience, but then you got the new, the deckhands who this might be their first trip. So there's going to be that learning curve. You know, the captains expect everybody to do your thing his way, and the new guys trying to learn everything to do that. So there's going to be that stress and, and all that going on. It's a hard, it's a it's a harsh working environment. Even when it's flat calm outside, or you know the water, you know you're still rocking, you're still doing all this. And then you throw in three to five foot seas, 10 foot seas, 20 foot seas, you know, wind, you know, it, it takes a toll on the body, you know, that works. Like I said, working long hours, um, usually, as we were discussing earlier, the fishing days have been condensed. They're cutting days for reporting that can uh, fish in certain areas, so that means you have to fish longer. Instead of working an eight hour day, working 12 hour days or 20 hour days or whatever it is, because you got to get the maximum amount of fish 
in a, in a certain amount of time. So that, that contributes to the stress level. Um, one of the biggest problems that we've seen lately is normalcy is, the normal is, is uh, routine may be lead to complacency, meaning you've done something a thousand times, you never had an incident, and all of a sudden you don't think about it, and the next day you get caught in a deck winch or a net or a fellow board or something, you know, because you're not thinking about, every, you, know, you don't think it's a stressful situation or a dangerous situation because you've done it a thousand times. <clears throat> and pressure to perform may lead to increased risk. Again, with the uh, closure of the seasons and, and the restrictions and everything else, people are taking chances. They're going into weather that they shouldn't go into. They're, they're fishing longer. They're, they're, they're taking chances that maybe they shouldn't be taking because they're trying to make their catch and the quota so they can make the trip profitable. Okay, hazards. Um, I don't know if you know this or not, but fishing vessel has been um, considered one of the most dangerous occupations for the last, I don't know how many years. And just recently, it, it was knocked out of number one. It used to be number one, now it's, I think, number two or maybe number three. <clears throat> but it was always number one of deaths per 100,000, you know, from the uh, Bureau of Labor Statistics. So it's a dangerous business. Um, when you're on the vessel, there's all kinds of hazards. One of the biggest ones that we hear about lately is people get caught up in deck winches. Uh, they get their, uh, their, their uh, slicks or their rain suits caught into it or um, their hands or whatnot. Um, you got your hatches, you got your um, trip, uh, slip trips and falls, you got your netting. There's all kinds of gear on deck. And when the boat's rock, it's very tough to, you know, it's just a very, very dangerous situation. Uh, combined spaces. Um, if there's not adequate ventilation for like a fish hole or a, a void or something, and you're storing gear down there and you're sending somebody down there, that's just an accident waiting to happen. Um, and this picture up here with the, uh, oh, that one right there, overboard, we lose a lot of, most of our casualties are people that fall over the side. And this is a good picture, as, as you can see, is they're wearing their, their rain gear, but no life jacket. They don't want to wear the life jackets because it's either too hot, too bulky, and when they fall over the side, it's, if, you're, if you see in this condition, it's going to be very tough for somebody to get up, especially when you're wearing a rain suit that fills with water. That's like a, a brick that's going to weigh you down. So, you know, um, that's the, the, the biggest cause of our fatalities in fishing vessels or, or man of uh, Material conditions. Um, they don't take care of the vessels like an inspected vessel would because we don't make, we don't require them to bring back water every uh, two years like we go to other vessels. So they flood, they sink, they capsize, uh, they, they're overloaded, they try to put as much stuff on board as they can, and then you get any kind of seas, you know, they, they, uh, they get swamped. Fatigue, as we just talked about a minute ago, these guys are trying to get as much as they can, do as, work as long as they can, and, and you know, the captains fall asleep, the crew members, you know, they're walking around like zombies and, and accidents happen. And uh, the last one is equipment failure. They're running their equipment to the brinks of, you know, there's very little maintenance done until it breaks, and then they'll fix it. They run aground, they lose steering, they lose propulsion. They get a situation where they can't, they can't recover. <clears throat> I just want to throw this up here. Um, as you can see, we're doing a pretty, we're doing a better job of decreasing our casualties in the fifth district. Um, we're not where we want to be. Of course, we would love to be at zero. I don't think that's ever going to happen. But you know, by doing the education, by doing the exams, at least we can. If, if you keep telling somebody something over and over and over again, hopefully they'll start to listen and they'll start doing it themselves. Um, but um, material. For in the past, the Coast Guard did a great job at making sure that uh, uh, fishermen could survive a fatality or a casualty, meaning they had equipment on board for a life raft, uh, uh, life wounds, um, PFDs, that type of things. But we did very little to make sure that the hull was in good shape or that water bag hatches were okay and that type of thing. So we're still harping on the, the safety side as, you know, with other things, survival craft. But we're also, there's also a shift in making sure the vessel is safe to go out. I mean, it's, it's kind of
kind of pointless to say, okay, you got all your safety gear, but you got a big old hole in the side of your ship, so we'll see you in about a couple hours when you're sleeping. And so we try to stop that and, and get them to take care of things. Okay, um, for personnel for our program, at the local level or the district level, I am the, the face of the program. Um, each sector has an examiner or a lead examiner, and then they also have uh, either other examiners or auxiliaries that do the exams for us. Um, we, we rely heavily on our auxiliary folks to do exams for us. In the, in the fifth district, we have about 60 of them, and they do, I think we're up to 385 exams this year that they've done for us. So they, they do quite a bit for us. Okay, on the headquarters, on the other side, um, we have a program manager who's at headquarters, uh, CBC3. He works directly for a captain, who works directly for the admiral, who works directly for the commandant. So we do have a means to get, you know, ideas and stuff up to high or our senior folks. Um, their job is to have oversight of the entire program. Um, they develop the regulations and the policy and uh, they do the data analysis of casualties and, and whatnot and they develop their programs based on that analysis at the district it's my job to be the filter between the headquarters and the field i provide funding for different things i provide uh, re uh, resources when available i do quality control over the data that they put into our, our uh, database which is called missile uh, every exam that they do they put in there and i just make sure that the right information so when they do the data analysis at headquarters this is stuff that they need to do that they need to make good decisions um, we conduct trend analysis and we also do um, or provide feedback when they're not doing what they're supposed to and at the sector they do the, the majority of the work they do the exams uh, they do cash investigations um, they do outreach uh, they follow up on terminations of vessels and that type of thing Okay, impact. What does all this mean? Um, we do a cash analysis whenever we have a marine casualty, especially a significant one. If it's a vessel loss or if it's a, a personnel casualty, but what we're trying to do is we're trying to come up with safety recommendations to, uh, to recommend so this doesn't happen again. The problem with that is it's hard to get the industry to buy off on a lot of our recommendations because our regulations are they're not like an inspected vessel we can't make them do a lot of things we can recommend and say this is best practice but if they choose not to sometimes we're, we're kind of our hands are tied with that we can keep recommending and hopefully they'll do it but sometimes it doesn't always work that way we conduct our uh, fishing vessel exams the idea is to make sure that the vessel has all the equipment that they need um, it provides a safer working environment. It gives uh, the, not only <coughs> me, but it also gives the, the captain and the crew a sense of security that, you know, once we go on board and say all oh, your safety gear is up to date, everything is good, that you can, you know, you're, you're okay to go out, you know. Uh, the workshops. Um, we, we try to hit on topics that are not normally covered in other uh, avenues like our stability stuff uh, we had a uh, it's, a it's a vessel a wooden vessel that we put in the water and we can move weight around and it shows you it, you know make the boat turn over if, if you're overloaded or if you don't have things like that so you can actually physically see what happens when you put all these crab pots all on one side of your vessel or if you're going into seas and you get swamped what's going to happen if you've got a high center of gravity and stuff you know when you talk about or show it in a powerpoint it's not the same as actually seeing it in real life and I don't think they would let us do it on a real vessel so <laughs> this little this little model makes works does does the trick. And like I said that wet trainer is a great example to show how difficult it is when you have a you start out with a simple leak on a hose so you're working on that and all of a sudden your shaft falls out and now you got water you know squirting back there and then you got another hole on the side of your ship and you got all these things going on at once. And you're getting drenched well that's real life that's what's going to happen in the casual it's not going to be a nice sunny day it's not going to be perfect you're going to have all these different issues so that gives the individual something to experience you know real time 
And the biggest thing is the dock walk, is getting our message out there, getting people to allow us to come on their vessels and, and, and doing uh, some of those things. Um, in the past, it was we wanted to come on board. It was not a requirement. Now, we still do the dock walks because like, <coughs> we still want all vessels to have an exam, not just those beyond three nautical miles. So if it's beyond, if it's within three nautical miles, we still want to get them and we want to make everybody safe. And this is just the contact information for uh, me and all the other examiners. If anybody needs, if anybody is in one of these areas and they need more information on a specific area, these guys, if you're in uh, Del Bay, Mr. Hefner, he knows the area a lot better than I do, or Mr. Everhart in North Carolina. They can point you in the right direction if you need anything there. Um, 